background, so put up a look on those people. Very good. So I, I've just done this uh, temporary thing with the beard. And, uh, the reaction has been uh, divided. Very, very, very divided. Either people really like it or they really hate it. It's very interesting. Yes. But if you're clean shaven, nobody ever reacts to that. No, no. I, in fact, yeah, I, I, uh, I really don't have uh, one way or the other. No, no, no. But it's, it's rare that you have some, somebody react to the way you look. Yeah, yeah. When the games begin. I think it's. Uh, I think you're right. If you, if you put on a beard, they react. Or you take one off. Oh. Okay, let's get started. I have the uh, I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this year's panel, which probably looks a lot like last year's panel. <laughs> Sitting to my um, immediate right is um, Mr. Roger Lafreniere, who is a Manitoba native. Uh, he's the only person here today who finds today's temperature balmy. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Lafreniere is now coming up to his fifth anniversary as a prothonotary of the federal court uh, here in Toronto. And if you don't know this man, it's because you've absolutely positively never been to a motion um, in Toronto over the last five years. Uh, seated to his right is Ron Dimmick, who's a senior partner at Dimmick Stratton Clarisio, a highly respected litigator in the IP area, and I'm proud to say a former partner of mine. Uh, Carol Hitchman, uh, I'm not proud not to say, is that conjugated right? Is not, is not a former partner of mine. Uh, Carol is a partner at Hitchman and Spriggings, uh, and certainly one of the leading litigators in the pharmaceutical, patent, and trademark uh, area. And she is currently Madam President of the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada. And I'm sor sorry you don't have your chain of office here today <laughs> to add authority to, uh, to what you already bring. Um, when we were talking about uh, what we're going to talk about today, um, that one of the topics that we came up with, which is going to be the second topic to deal with, is preempted by the first topic, which um, Mr. Lafreniere is going to be addressing. And uh, he didn't like the title of this slide because it implied the federal court was out of business at one point. Um, but I think you better explain, uh, Mr. Lafreniere, what I meant by this slide when I said the federal court is back in business. There has been in the... Um I guess ever since I've been uh, appointed as a prothonotary back in 1999, um, some great uh, frustration because I manage cases and I bring them to a pretrial, and then the next thing you know, we're waiting uh, a year, a year and a half before uh, a trial can be can be heard. Uh, it sometimes takes six months after the uh, pretrial conference even just to get the, the date of of the trial. Um, but there, there has been uh, some pressure that's been placed by uh, the Admiralty Bar, uh, by the uh, Intellectual Property Bar, Mr. Dimmick in particular, uh, to have uh, more judges and judicial officers appointed to the federal court. 2003 has been a good year for us. Uh, we've, we've had, um, I, I'm, I'm using the Chief Justice's uh, figures, he says uh, eight uh, judicial officers appointed in 2003, I, I, I think it might even be uh, higher than that. But um, it suffice it to say that we now have um, two new prothonotaries, one in, in Ottawa and a, a new one in, in Toronto. As a matter of fact, my colleague is here today, prothonotary Milchinski, who is going to stand up uh, so that everybody can recognize her, uh, was recently appointed back in November and uh, has certainly made my life much easier. Uh, so as a result of these uh, new judicial officers, we're now um, uh, in business and continuing in business, but maybe in a more efficient and uh, effective manner. Uh, there, I, I think it's known by everybody, I say it every time I do a pretrial conference, that there is a backlog of, of trials, um, uh, backlog in that uh, the judicial administrator that fixes the trial dates has a, a list of, uh, of cases that is in a queue to be uh, set down for, for trial. With the new judges, we now have the flexibility to start tackling that backlog. The Chief Justice has um, uh, allowed me to uh, provide you with some information, which uh, hopefully will, um, uh, will show you that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. 
we're going to be looking at um, uh, the possibility of, uh, of uh, assigning trial dates uh, almost immediately after, actually at the pretrial itself or immediately after the pretrial. We're looking at that. That is our goal to be able to to be able to do that, so that the pretrial conference will be uh, much closer to the uh, trial date than it is presently. Uh, in order to do this, we're going to be, uh, and in order to attack the um, the uh, the backlog, where uh, the Chief Justice is looking at the possibility of double booking, uh, at least in the interim, double booking um, trials, so that. Um, uh, you might see on occasion a 10-day trial uh, also fixed at the same time as a five-day trial. Uh, I, I don't think it's a mystery to most people. Most trials do, do not proceed. Uh, it's uh, really quite extraordinary. I, I fix a number of trial dates, but the actual ones that go ahead are f few and far between. So uh, there might be an attempt here to allow for double booking and hopefully uh, one or the other or maybe the two will will uh, will uh, be resolved before then but this is an attempt here to try and um, and, and deal with uh, some some delay there's also one other thing that we're going to be probably um, doing and that is being uh, less nice to counsel when sign assigning trial dates we're a very um, open court very uh, transparent court. We usually consult counsel with respect to trial dates, but we've been finding that when we uh, are offering dates, um, counsel are being somewhat difficult with us. And um, uh, the judicial administrator is ill-placed to really make any decisions on that. So it, it may be that your um, case management um, judge or prothonotary or the chief justice might be calling you to ask you why you're not accepting the dates that are being um, proposed. And if it's simply because you have a discovery date or if it's simply because you're on holidays, I'm not sure that's going to be sufficient. Um, if there's another hearing uh, scheduled before the court, uh, the question might be, why is somebody else in your law firm not doing this? So it's going to be maybe more probing questions because right now we are losing dates that are available for hearings because one or the other party is not available. So uh, our goal here is to uh, be able to have trials uh, fixed fairly quickly after the pretrial conference. And while I'm on this subject, um, uh, there is going to be a, a push by the case management judges and prothonotaries to get expert reports in as soon as possible, uh, even maybe before the pretrial conference. Uh, but I recognize that at this point, with trial dates that are a year away, that not, might not be feasible. But uh, we're going to be looking at that, uh, especially in case management cases where um, uh, expert reports could really assist in the uh, pretrial conference uh, in order to determine whether the matter can and should be settled. But we're going to have to be able to offer you quicker dates for trial, and we recognize that. But that is our goal. So those are the few short points that I, I wanted to make. Um, there, was a, there was, I think, Mr. Lafreniere, some uh, anecdotal information that you um, shared with us last week that perhaps you'd be at liberty to share with us again now that I'm putting you on the spot. But that was the fact that I think just prior to um, uh, Christmas time, a trial, a 10-day trial was offered to counsel for April, April 2004, not April 2005, which I think most of us are sort of used to in terms of the timeline. And I think when you spoke to us last year, it was certainly, yes, we're trying to, we're hoping things will, will hurry up and get speeded up and we'd like to be more efficient. I think it's certainly evidence of the fact that with the recent appointments, um, that calendar certainly is much more compressed than it was uh, a year ago. And Ron will probably join, and Carol will probably join me in saying, thank bloody goodness and, uh, and about time. But I should just indicate that um, when I received the email from the judicial administrator to offer the dates to counsel in April, I had to email back say, did you mean 2005? I really, I was really quite surprised that uh, they were offering a, a 10 day trial in, in, in April, which is essentially six months. It was a six month uh, notice. And amazingly, council uh, were refusing the dates because they were too quick. Uh, <laughs> and, and so you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. One more thing I, I just want to add before, uh, it was just one last thing. Uh, NOC proceedings have, uh, the, Patented Medicines Notice of Compliance Proceedings have really caused a lot of um, 
a, a lot of work for both prothonotaries and judges, but mostly prothonotaries actually. A uh, number of uh, motions are uh, in, the, in these matters, but in terms of uh, hearing dates for that, um, the court has uh, been able to meet the 24-month uh, statutory period and actually anticipates that a hearing date will be required and tentatively sets aside those, those dates so that there's no surprise at the end where you're, you're a few months before the end of the statutory deadline and hearing dates are being requested. But I should just tell you, back in 2002, there were a certain number of NOCs. They tripled in 2003, and we're seeing the trend actually increasing. But at the same time, we're seeing a, a trend towards some settlement of them, which we had not seen before. So I, I'm, we're, these are relatively uh, interesting developments, but um, all, for the most part, we're, uh, we're able to cope relatively well. And I find that oftentimes it's counsel's availability that causes problems. I think that it's a big uh, change in the court now to have trial dates um, given at the pretrial conference, which is really what the uh, new rules were meant to do back when they were implemented in 1989. Uh, 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 and uh, I think what we were suffering through uh, was uh, so few judges to hear the uh, many cases that were before the federal court, and it was like the Beach Boys songs. Uh, a title when uh, you were trying to get through your case ready f uh, for trial in one year and then you have to wait three years for trial. It was like you, you, know, you uh, get there fast to take it slow. And uh, I think now that uh, you have to get there fast and you have to be ready for trial quickly as well. Um, we thought for the first, uh, first topic for the panel to, to deal with, and, and Mr. Lafreniere is going to take the lead on this, we're if I can have the next slide up, were to talk about five things that bug prothonotaries about IP counsel. Um, now, let me offer Mr. Lafreniere's disclaimer before he does, but he said, uh, quite frankly, he's delighted with uh, most IP counsel, but there are a few little warts and wrinkles that, that he wouldn't mind clearing up. So the first, Mr. Lafreniere, if you want to start it off, and I'm sure we'll jump in, uh, decorum and civility. Once again, this is a, a topic that was imposed on me. Um, I, I, uh, Wait a minute. The, head, the heading was imposed on you. The rest, the rest is all his. Oh, the decorum and civility I have no problems with. Um, I can talk about that. But uh, when I... You'll excuse me for interrupting. <laughs> uh, we do have contempt proceedings. Uh, I, when I was asked to come up with a list of uh, five things that bug prothonotaries about IP counsel, I, to, to be frank, it was relatively difficult. I find that the IP bar is probably the most professional, courteous, and well-prepared bar. Um, and I don't say this lightly. We, ha we have very professional people who appear before us. We have the Admiralty bar. Um, we have other bars I'm not going to mention. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, decorum and civility is, a, is an issue that transcends all the bars. And um, I was just speaking to uh, one counsel just before um, we, I started this presentation. And uh, she mentioned the fact that she would love it if I talked about civility in, before this court. And um, I, interestingly enough, it was on the agenda. Uh, there has been a, a trend, uh, which is unfortunate, of um, people uh, appearing before the court and actually showing their emotions before the court. Um, and I can just imagine what it's like outside of court. Uh, there, I, I, I think there's a, a distinction to be drawn between uh, the civility between themselves and also the civility towards the court. Uh, I talk about decorum before the court, and I talk about civility between counsel. And I, I can't help but observe that there is a, 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 an unfortunate tendency by some uh, to be less than civil towards each other in, in the courtroom and outside. Don't forget that I actually walk down the hallway sometimes, and I can hear stuff going on. It, it does reflect on, on counsel. And I, I do hear things, and it's not because I'm listening in. I happen to be passing by. But um, suffice it to say, um, I don't like it when counsel continue to argue after I've made a decision. If I've made a decision that particulars are going to be provided or are not going to be provided, it's, it, let's get on to the next point. It becomes somewhat problematic because uh, having to re remind counsel that uh, the decision has been taken um, is uh, 
problematic. It's problematic in that it's wasting time for everybody, and it's also showing, uh, it's, it aggravates the court. Um, failing to uh, serve and file books of authorities uh, with your motion records. Now, you, you might find that um, not being pro pro problematic, but you show up in court with your book of authorities. What does that do for the court? The court is, is, is re required to take time to read those authorities. Either you read it to them or, or read it to the court, or the court is going to have to break to read it, or the court will have to reserve on a decision. And I, I believe it's really a question of getting those book of authorities in on, on time. I'll, yeah. I'll echo that because there's nothing more irritating than having to put together your own book of authorities when you've already been served with the motion material. So. And typically I end up with a different reported version than the one the other side has, so we're all looking at a different page. So I think uh, there are some practical problems with getting it at the last minute. Or I get a book of authorities that's been filed and then um, I get all these loose leaf uh, case, cases filed with me on the date of the hearing, which are thicker than the book of authorities that was filed originally. Which, I, I'm not suggesting that there isn't, um, uh, there aren't cases where um, at, at the last minute you became aware of um, some, some authorities. But for the most part, you, you be, became aware, faxed them to the court ahead of time, faxed them to the other counsel, so that we're not uh, wasting time in court. Uh, in terms of civility as well, it's not simply uh, appearances before the court, but also uh, letters that are sent to the court um, criticizing uh, about other counsel. Uh, very inappropriate. Uh, it places the court in an uncomfortable position. I oftentimes feel like uh, simply directing the registry to reject the document. But unfortunately, there's one paragraph in the, this, in the letter that actually makes a request to the court. So uh, it becomes problematic. But um, uh, to be frank, uh, there will have to be something done about that if there's a persistent um, uh, attempt by counsel to undermine and to, uh, to, to harass the other counsel through correspondence to the court. Uh, one thing uh, about counsel, and you probably don't even notice it, but I do, uh, I, I do observe um, counsel. The drumming of fingers, uh, throwing objects, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, rolling your eyes and heavy sighs, uh, those are, uh, I can't help but notice, you're, you're right in front of me. And uh, I'm not sure if it helps your case or if it doesn't, um, but suffice it to say, you may want to think about that. <laughs> and one last thing on the decorum and civility. If you're going to show up late in court, if you've made a mistake, apologize. Just do it. Don't wait for the court to ask you for it because it, it puts court in an uncomfortable position. For the most part, I understand if somebody's late, it, it, it happens. Just apologize. Um, and apologize to your, your opposing counsel as well. So those are my little issues on decorum and civility. Okay, next up is, um, is dealing with costs, and this is uh, how costs are dealt with at the disposition of a, of a motion. I thought there was going to be a little more interaction. Did you want to add anything on yeah, civility? Uh, <laughs> she, was civility? Her, she was drumming her fingers, I think, yeah. when you cast that. Um, or we were talking about something else. Oh, yeah, no. Well, I, on, I can add something on civility, and that is, I mean, I've been the subject of those sort of comments that went back and forth, and I, I can't help but think that that doesn't impress the court in the long run. And uh, when I was responding back, I tried, I did not copy the court because I didn't think that was appropriate. Um, and I am aware of a case where one counsel um, rolled his eyes and the Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal <laughs> said, are you rolling your eyes at me, Mr. So-and-so? -so? so, I mean, they clearly do pick up on those things. And, and on the reply to reply to reply, frankly, counsel appreciate when the court steps in and says that's enough argument because um, it makes things really awkward for counsel when uh, it, there's this sort of interminable argument. So I'm actually delighted to hear all of those comments. Speaking of interminable, I just want to remind the panel we have a few more topics to cover, so we better move <laughs> on uh, faster rather than slower. Um, can we can we now, Mr. Lafreniere, perhaps deal with uh, <laughs> I'll deal be, with costs? I'll, I'll be succinct on the issue of costs. Um, the issue of costs is um, sometimes takes longer to deal with than on the substantive motion. It, it's almost ridiculous. Counsel always seem to be so surprised when I ask them, "What are you asking for costs?" It's a simple matter. If you feel that like costs should be in your in your favor, tell me tell me the amount that you want and tell me whether you want it in the cause in the event of the cause 
forth with or whatever. Just tell me, it's not rocket science here. It, it really isn't. I, I, I hear these issues all the time. If you want me to fix them, I'll fix them. I can, I can determine that relatively easily. But if you have particular expenses, disbursements, etc., at least anticipate that the court is going to hear you on this and prepare a draft bill of costs, at least on, on, on those issues. Because the court's um, in an impossible position trying to make the decision without really any record, and that makes it fairly difficult. I'd like to uh, suggest uh, this procedure. It's, um, it's one I think that uh, uh, Mr. Lefenier would, would welcome uh, and others of the court would as well. And that is when you file your materials seeking uh, an order that in your written representations deal with the matter of costs um, right there and then. Uh, now things might change during the course of the hearing itself and you can supplement what you've said in your written submissions, uh, written representations, when you actually argue it. But give some thought to costs when you file your written reps. Likewise, the respondent should also deal with the costs in the written representations, and uh, it will avoid having to spend too much time arguing, and it also brings to mind as to how much the, uh, the motion will cost, and it might also lead to settlement of the motion if you're asking for a great uh, large amount of, of money and uh, the other side thinks that uh, it might lose. So um, I deal with costs right in the written reps. Um, Mr. Lafreniere, you talked about uh, the, the wrong way to communicate um, with the court in terms of uh, complaining about counsel's conduct. Uh, what's the right way to do it? Well, uh, in terms of communication with the court, where, uh, as you know, we deal with, uh, with case management, we deal with uh, other pr matters that are uh, case management files and we deal with other managers that are, that are not managed. And for the most part, there's correspondence coming into court and a, it's really a flood of correspondence. We need to deal with them as efficiently as possible. Uh, the registry needs to, kn to know who to direct the correspondence to. But um, what, what used to happen was counsel would write directly, actually address the letters to, to the judicial officer like a prothonotary or the judge. That's inappropriate. You have to send it to the court and ask that in the body of your letter that the correspondence be sent to uh, the case manager. But uh, when writing to the court, when communicating to the court, you should identify who you represent. Don't assume that I know who you represent. It, it, I can read a whole letter and not know who, whether you're the plaintiff, the respondent, an intervener, or maybe just a, an intermeddler. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, and you, sometimes you don't even put the right file number on there, so it makes it very, very difficult to figure this out. You should clearly indicate what you're requesting from the court, not just say, I'm asking for a case management conference and stop there. What does that do for me? For what purpose? What's your estimated duration? Um, uh, does the other side know that you've made the request? Is this on consent? Give me the information that I need in order to make the decision. So if you're asking for a case management conference, tell me who you are, tell me uh, what the purpose of the uh, case management conference is, tell me whether the other side is, is in agreement with it, give me an agenda for the meeting, and estimate duration and the availability of counsel. Uh, if, if you're available, on, mutually available, not your own availability, because that doesn't help me. So if you have all that information, perfect. And I realize that sometimes you can't get a, the information from the other side. Put that in the letter. I've tried to get this information from the other side. They would not give it to me. And at least we'll go chasing after them after that. I, that's, that's the part of the letter where you put in what a big jerk the lawyer is on the other side. <laughs> right? I, I recommend that uh, you put the who you are why you're uh, writing and that, the mat that this letter should be given to the personatory or to the judge in the first paragraph or in the first sentence because the registrars, the, uh, the administrators over in the federal court receive many letters during the day and um, if, if it's simply stated in the first sentence or paragraph as to, to whom it's going to go and why then they don't have to read the rest of the letter and get all confused as to what's going to happen. So I'd put it right up front. I just have one question for the prothonotary. Um, you've indicated that when writing to the court, even if you want the letter to end up at a, with a judge or a prothonotary, always to address it to the court. And is that the case even where a judge has asked for specific things to be sent to them? Absolutely, because the, um, 
the letter has to, to be addressed. You're not, the judge doesn't own the file. It's sent to the court and it's sent to the attention of, uh, bring this to the attention of this um, specific judicial officer. Uh, just so you know, there's literally hundreds, if not I, even up to a thousand letters received by the federal court a day. Uh, so it, the, the volume is so extraordinary. We have to be able to, uh, to, to deal with these in a, in a very efficient manner. And as I've indicated to counsel already in the previous um, um, panel discussions, fax correspondence actually comes to us later than um, delivered ones. Uh, it's, it's, an, an odd, it's an anomaly because it stays on the fax machine, but the delivered ones actually get to a person's hands. It's very odd. So don't, don't assume that your fax comes to the court's attention immediately. It does get to the court's attention, but maybe not as fast. Um, I'll echo Ron's comment too. If you think you want to be nice to the judges and you think you want to be nice to the prothonotaries, because for proper decorum and respect as a junior lawyer, people you really should be nice to are the registrars, and Ron's <laughs> suggestion is an excellent one, because if you've got a reputation for helping them do their job, they'll probably help you with, um, with what you want. Uh, next item, arguing motions. All right. Um, we don't like it when you, you raise new arguments uh, in your, uh, at, the, at the return of the motion. If, if, you're gonna, if you've got a new argument that, that the other side is not aware of, um, you should give notice of that you should uh, seek to file a supplementary record so that at least the court will, will be able to deal with that. Um, I've talked about case law being submitted last, uh, at the last moment as well. Um, I think it's unfortunate when counsel shows up in court and uh, has evidently not prepared the motion materials and uh, has relied on somebody else to do so and, and when asked a question doesn't know how to address that. I think become familiar with your materials. It, it seems fundamental, but um, oftentimes you'll have a situation where counsel on the fly is tendering evidence, uh, which, which is lacking <laughs> through their arguments. And uh, I, I think that reflects badly on, on counsel. And probably the, 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 the one that bugs me the most <clears throat> is um, people, ask, people know that for general sittings you have two hours for, for a motion but I always have a bidding war at the beginning of the day. So I, I, I make counsel um, um, tell me how long it's going to be. The ones that are the shortest will be heard the quickest. But if you have told me that you're gonna be shorter, I expect you to be at the length of time that you've told me. So uh, what oftentimes happens is counsel will um, just exceed the time. I should just tell you, I do cut you off and I will ask you to sit down. I, that is my practice. It's a, it's a question of simply acknowledging that there is, um, uh, we have to be efficient in the manner that, that, that we proceed. If counsel tells me they're going to be half an hour for their argument, I'll tell you at a half an hour, I'll be saying, why should, uh, please sit down. Or un unless something really came out of surprise that needs to be addressed. I think we should all realize that uh, uh, Prasantra Lafreniere and others in the court do read the materials ahead of time and, and unless he's, uh, if, if that's not the case, he'll certainly let you know, but uh, assume that the materials have been read. You don't have to ask whether they've been read. Assume that they've been read, and that can cut short a lot of your argument, and you can get right down to the essence of it. Yeah, I remember one day in Mr. Lafreniere's court, uh, I had the motion, and I got up to start my spiel, and he said, Mr. Cameron, I've read your materials, I've read the other side's materials. What do you have to say in reply to the other side's materials? So it certainly shortened the length of the hearing, um, and that doesn't happen in every court, but thankfully it happens in certain courts. Um, having said that, if you're going to adjourn the motion, let the court know as soon as you can so he doesn't spend the night before reading it. Actually, it's a Sunday because we hear the matters on the Monday. And um, the registry gets the material up to us at the cl after the close of business on Friday. Uh -oh. So we're, we're there on the weekend reading the, your materials, your wonderful materials, especially uh, uh, the uh, notice of compliance uh, matters, which are this thick. And then on, on Monday morning, a fax that came in late on Friday, but came in before close of business, but of course didn't come to my attention, uh, gets dropped on my desk, and here it is. I've, I've read uh, motion materials this thick, and oh, we settled it. Uh, although I'm happy not having to deal with it, it, it was a waste of time. And um, it, it would be uh, appreciated if you could um, uh, advise us as quickly as possible. And what would be the best way to advise you if the faxes aren't getting to you? Uh, the, the practice in Toronto, 
the, in Toronto is that uh, every council is called on every motion that's scheduled. Uh, and so you have a name of a registry officer who is assigned to the judicial officer who's hearing the case. So you have a person to call. Call. Oh, they're going to be, um, um, actually this just happened this week, they're going to be putting voicemail for every registry officer, uh, which is an extraordinary thing. Right now there's no voicemail. I finally got a voicemail for case management um, registry officers and it took uh, almost a year to get that. And now all of a sudden everybody's getting it. But uh, at least now you'll be able to leave messages. But it's better to speak to a person though, just in case that person's... Uh, away from the office. If you can't find the registrar, is it proper protocol to contact the assistants to the prothonotaries, the secretarial assistants? Absolutely not. Okay. Because they, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. Can we call you at home? <laughs> <laughs> I did have counsel call me. <laughs> counsel called me uh, in Santa Ann, Manitoba at my parents' place. I don't know how they found <laughs> I cannot believe it. was in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, can, you can imagine, I get a phone call. My dad says, there's a lawyer who wants to speak to you. And, I, and there it is. It's uh, Mr. Neil Belmore. And, uh, <laughs> Mr. He's Bel at Gowlings for anybody that doesn't, doesn't know that. Mr. Bel Mr. Belmore tells me, Mr. Laffinger, I know this is completely inappropriate. <laughs> but I'm here with Mr. Strasburg. And we have just settled the case. And he knew I had a pile coming back from my, my holidays. And I appreciated that call. But <laughs> don't ever do it. <laughs> OK, last but not least, item number five, appeals from prothonotary decisions. The fact that we take appeals from prothonotary decisions? <laughs> well, I, as I said, I was having difficulty coming up with any issues, so I just thought, well, we don't like appeals from prothonotaries. <laughs> but actually, it, it it's really doesn't have to do with appeals. It has everything to do with failing to keep a case manager informed as to what's happening. You may appeal a decision and assume that the case manager knows that it's been appealed. That's wrong. We don't know. You file an appeal, it's filed. And we're sitting there waiting for, we, we have a BF for everything that you're supposed to do. We don't know what's happening. Nobody tells us. If you have an appeal, tell us. And tell us what you're proposing to do with your case. Uh, it's a simple matter. An appeal does not operate as a, as a stay. So if you have a schedule to do certain things, you're, and you're supposed to be doing it. So if you want to vary it, do it right now rather than having the court um, chasing you and asking you what's going on. And uh, just so you know, we're now the federal court. We're no longer the federal court of Canada. It's a federal court. And then there's a federal court of appeal um, because of the changes to the, um, to, the, uh, to the act. So we're the federal courts now, the federal courts act. Well, um, when the, anything is filed in the federal court of appeal, that's even more distant. I, I tell you, just finding out anything from them is very, very difficult. So there's an appeal from me to a judge that then goes to the Court of Appeal. That I definitely don't know about. Next thing I know, I'm writing a letter, I, I'm, I'm asking the registry to, what's happening on this. I get this condescending letter saying, well, of course, we've appealed the decision. <laughs> well, we don't know. So just keep us informed. Just tell us that an appeal has been filed. And actually, there's a, there's a problem with the rules in that you can appeal and just serve it, but not file it. That, that's, so it, it, there's, you can serve it within the 10 days, I think, but it doesn't need to be filed within 10 days. So we just go along, assuming that th there's been no appeal, and then all of a sudden it's fixed for hearing um, by the filing of the document. And so we don't know about that. We're gonna fix that in the rules. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lafreniere. I forgot to mention that if anybody has any questions as we go along, please uh, put up your hand. Um, if not, we'll move on. There have been some interesting uh, case developments in the federal court practice area. Uh, the first, um, and by the way, behind tab, I think it's um, tab four of the materials, there's a page that lists some of the cases that are being discussed um, by the panel today and the URL or URL or Universal Resource Locator or that place you go on the internet to get a copy of it. Um, we've not included them in the materials, but they're certainly posted. 
Um, so the first topic for our panel is the scope of discovery, and I think, Ron, you were going to take the lead on this point. Uh, this has to do with um, um, uh, what, what are the um, conditions uh, and that the court will apply in turning off the tap of discovery. And what happened in the American Apotex case was that the prothonotary uh, came to the conclusion that there were too many questions and the question and the discovery was taking too long so that the um, defendant was uh, cut off any further discovery on some questions where there was no finding of irrelevance and what have you. Um, this was taken uh, on appeal to a judge and then ultimately to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal and said that the prothonotary, uh, even though um, w the the Bethonary was acting as a case manager, and you shouldn't interfere with a case manager's decision unless it's uh, uh, quite beyond the pale, uh, said that uh, in this case, cutting off discovery was not complying with Rule 3, which says that one should look to see that the um, rules are applied so you get the just, most expeditious, and uh, economical uh, determination on the merits and what the court concluded is that it was unjust to the party asking the questions that it was cut off asking relevant questions and so it uh, sent it back to the judge to the prothonotary to look to see whether the questions indeed were relevant or not or proper or not not to, to use case management to uh, curtail uh, proper examination so I think it, it, it indicates that there's a, a tension between uh, the cases that are taking a long time to be uh, processed and discoveries seem to be taking longer than ever before and uh, wanting to make sure that uh, uh, the party bringing the action can get the just, most uh, expeditious economical determination. But it's clear that you cannot curtail discovery simply because it's taking too long. And it's interesting. Like in my the, answer. <laughs> in this case, um, Mr. Justice Strayer, who wrote the decision, said, I would also observe that limiting the scope of questions for the sake of speed may in some cases be counterproductive. And his point was that the whole idea behind discovery is to find out the case you have to meet and to narrow the issues for trial, and that by allowing the discovery to go on a little longer, it could in the long run actually um, end up shortening the case as opposed to cutting off the discovery questions, which is uh, what the prothonotary had ordered. I think it's interesting to note that uh, chronologically we often run a few years behind the practice in the United States. Um, and I remember one case I was involved with a few years ago. At one point a lawyer looked at his watch, why he looked at his watch instead of the calendar, I don't know, and said, there, we've just finished a year of, of uh, depositions and that there had been 365 days of depositions in this U.S. case of, you know, 50 or so witnesses by each side or the other side or whatever. As a result of the, what they call discovery abuse in the United States, they actually short, have changed the rules in the states to limit the time you're allowed to take a deposition up to, I think it's a day, unless you get leave of the court to extend it longer. So it's sort of, you know, ask your best questions and then, you know, move on. So hopefully we won't ever get to the stage where we have to um, statutorily limit the length of discovery, but um, there are cases that I, I would say involve discovery abuse where it just goes on and on and on. I'll cut it off at that point. I, I think um, uh, Prothonotary Morneau was faced with a fairly um, unique fact situation in that case, but um, I, I, after discussing it with him, I, it was clear that he didn't have a motion under Rule 2, 243. Uh, just to read it to you, on motion, the court may limit an examination for discovery that it considers to be oppressive, vexatious, or unnecessary. If you really do believe that it's oppressive or vexatious or unnecessary, you do have resort to that. And um, it, it, the problem in, in that case was there wasn't a finding that uh, uh, that that was the case. It was just taking too long. And so you do have ac access to that rule to uh, to deal with uh, um, some difficult cases. One procedure may, we might want to consider adopting uh, from the United States practice, and we couldn't uh, perhaps uh, present this to the Rules Committee, but. Uh, in the United States on a deposition, if there's an objection to a question other than privilege, uh, 
uh, the witness is, is meant to answer the question on the deposition, and then there's a debate afterwards before the trial judge to see whether or not it gets into the trial record. Um, it would eliminate quite considerably the uh, number of motions to compel answers and the length of these motions if we adopted that procedure, and I think it's one we should consider. Yeah, but then discoveries wouldn't be so much fun. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or we wouldn't see Mr. Lafreniere as often as we do. <laughs> Um, moving and, on to our... And you wouldn't be as uncivil to each other. <laughs> <laughs> There's a theme developing here. Uh, the next topic is uh, amendments to pleadings, and I think, Carol, you're going to take the lead on this point. Uh, this is an interesting case in juxtaposition with the one that uh, Ron just spoke about, and this one is also a decision out of the Court of Appeal. It's very recent. Um, we all assume that we can amend our pleadings pretty much right up to the time of trial, and there are even cases where amendments have taken place after trial. Um, in this case, the court uh, overturned uh, an amendment of pleadings and said, no, you cannot um, amend at the last minute, or even here, it wasn't even the last minute. In this case, it was uh, Merck and Apotex, um, the famous lisinopril. There had been NOC proceedings where Apotex had said, yes, we infringe, but we rely on our Section 56 defense, which means that they had acquired the product um, prior to the whatever date it is under the specific uh, version of the Patent Act, which exempts infringement. Um, in that case, in the NOC proceeding, uh, it had been argued by the patentee that Apotex was going to run out of inventory and shouldn't be able to get an NOC, and the court said no, that wasn't a basis to refuse it, and they allowed them to go out on the market. Merck started the, a patent infringement case, Apotex pleaded again the Section 56 defense, and then after discoveries came back and said, we'd like to amend our pleading to say um, that there's a question about the interpretation of the patent, that the patent claims cover lisinopril, uh, but we're making lisinopril dihydrate, and uh, they filed an affidavit of co-counsel to support the amendment. Now, what's interesting here is the court looked at the test, which we're all familiar with for overturning prothonotaries, and um, typically what happens is the test is two-pronged. Um, was the prothonotary clearly wrong or uh, does this raise questions vital to the final issue of the case? And instead of looking at the clearly wrong test, which is typically what's done, the court flipped it around and said, no, I want to look at the question, does this raise questions vital to the final issue of the case? dealt with that issue first, said this was, um, this was one of those type of issues, and as a result, they could exercise de novo um, the discretion that the prothonotary had exercised, which may impact on how appeals from pro prothonotaries go forward from now on. Um, and then in exercising that decision, found that what Apotex was in essence doing was withdrawing an admission. Uh, by trying to now argue the construction of the patent when up to now they had admitted infringement, um, and that the burden was on Apotex to demonstrate that their new defense was a reasonable one, and that you couldn't simply assume that if you asked for an amendment that you would get it. Um, and then the court also considered, and this is interesting based on this dis discovery case, that y this was a very late um, request, that it was going to screw up the proceedings, that they were a long way along, and it was going to make the trial more complex, and in, in essence, the amendment would derail the litigation. And that being the case, they refused the amendment, and this is going to be interesting to see how it develops down the road, because it's somewhat different from the approach that we've seen up to now. Now, there is a dissent in that decision by the Chief Justice, um, and in his view, you have to take a liberal approach with respect to the amendment of pleadings, and he would have allowed the amendment. Um, and now, whether or not you'd get leave on a case like this to the Supreme Court of Canada, I don't know, because it is a practice case. Uh, but we'll have to see where it goes from there. But it's an interesting case because it's not really the same as what we saw with Mr. Justice Strayer. It's a little stricter. Um, and it also puts us in mind that when we're drafting our pleadings from the get-go, we better be careful uh, about making sure that we're not making admissions that we're going to need to withdraw or want to withdraw later. Thank you, Carol. Um, next item for discussion, I think this is yours too, Carol, is uh, talking about stays of proceedings. Yeah, now this, the reason I've been asked to talk about this is because um, Don and Ron are on either sides of this one. 
And uh, these are cases, the Johnson & Johnson versus Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson versus Arterial Vascular Engineering. Before you get too far, Carol, uh, Ron, you and I do have the right to interject and object if she misrepresents anything. <laughs> and seek okay. leave to appeal yeah, to uh, that's right. Roger the friend. two of us. And I, I'm case managing the, the proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> I am. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm Pretty well, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, everyone here knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, this is a very odd decision. And the reason I say that is because it's not a set of reasons. It's an order. And so it, it, goes, it wasn't my decision. Yeah, no, OK. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me begin by saying this is a decision of a trial judge. Um, but it's an order, so it goes upon, 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 upon. And there's, there's no real analysis being done. But the facts of this case are rather interesting. You've heard about Dutch Industries, the problems that it has created. This was a case where um, the plaintiff brought a patent infringement action, defendant amends their pleadings to say that the patent's invalid because they paid on a small entity basis instead of the large entity basis. They bring a motion for summary judgment and the court, instead of coming to a decision on this motion for summary judgment, grants a stay. And he grants a stay on the basis that we've had Dutch Industries in the trial division, it's gone to the Court of Appeal, leave's been granted to the Supreme Court of Canada, um, the, uh, there's going to be legislation retroactively to fix this, and let's just sit around and wait a year to see what happens. And my understanding of the law is that that's not totally consistent with the Supreme Court of Canada and what's required for a stay, or the fact that you can grant a stay to awaiting legislation to change. Um, so it's, it, it doesn't seem to address the points. And then what's also interesting is the matter was heard on June the 24th. Um, the decision wasn't actually released until November 27th, and the one-year stay was granted from November 27th. And at this point, uh, we still don't have any, we do have draft legislation, but there's no real timetable for that legislation to come into place. And meanwhile, the whole action, plus the summary judgment, are sitting there stayed. Um, now, my understanding is this is under appeal, and I guess it'll be a question of whether the appeal court can hear this uh, before the legislation comes in. But it, it's a rather strange decision in the sense that there's not a lot of reasoning going on here and it, it doesn't seem to be consistent uh, with the established law. Do we dare say anything, Ron? I, I asked uh, Mr. Uh, Dimmick to send me a letter to tell me it, it's been appealed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's the one appealing, so that's his fault, not my fault. Oh, okay. Okay. Just, just so I'll that's clear. note of that. I, I agree with what Carol had to say. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it should be noted that the Dutch Industries case um, is now a final. Uh, the leave to the Supreme Court of Canada was denied, and so the judge's uh, basis for granting the stay in that case was twofold. As Carol mentioned, uh, the leave application to the Supreme Court of Canada and the prospect of legislation rectifying the situation retroactively um, the leave has now been denied, so there's only one basis uh, that the judge could have given his, uh, his um, stay, and uh, so we're going to be arguing that in the Court of Appeal, that uh, um, you cannot uh, stay something uh, waiting for legislation which may or may not happen. And I'm reminded of uh, Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live when he was doing count, uh, point counterpoint with Jane Curtin, but I won't say, Carol, you ignorant lawyer, or whatever, <laughs> whatever Mr. Um, Aykroyd used to say. Um, to, to put a slightly different spin on the same circumstances. I'm rolling my eyes at you, Don. <laughs> as long as you don't roll your eyes at him. I think you're rolling your eyes at Mr. Justice Martin, though, so to come to his defense, um, the, uh, an analogy someone offered was is that um, uh, there's currently a death penalty, and um, Parliament said they're doing away with the death penalty, and certain people would like to see certain people hang in the meantime. So Mr. Justice Martineau says, let's wait and see if retroactively uh, they're abolishing the death penalty. Um, let's see what the legislation has to say. I think it's a capital idea. Okay. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> uh, for those of you who um, delight in the demise of, uh, of law firms, uh, you may have seen in the news recently that uh, the humongo U.S. law firm of Penny and Edmonds is breaking up, uh, due in no small part to a conflict of interest situation <laughs> they encountered when representing Pfizer and the University of Rochester uh, at the same time 
when one company was suing the other for patent infringement and the firm was giving advice to um, the other about how to deal with that other entity. Um, certainly in the area of intellectual property law, we do have the problem that we have a whole bunch of clients, especially in the uh, agency side as well as on the litigation side. And this raises new issues in, in view of uh, the Neal case the Supreme Court of Canada came down with about whether you can or can't act uh, for a certain, uh, certain party. And who'd like to start on this one? Ron? Uh, there, there are two cases this year um, that dealt with this. One was uh, Milani and Sacno, and the other was Esco and Quality Steel. So I'll ask Carol to speak to the latter, <laughs> Esco and Quality Steel. OK. In, in the Esco and Quality Steel case, um, there was a motion to remove the Dimmick firm. And in this case, and, and we can all identify with this, this poor associate gets an email that says, is there a conflict you know, for us acting in this case? And he has no recollection of ever acting for this company. And of course, lo and behold, turns out that in another life, while uh, a member of uh, Scott Nail and now Borden Ladner, he actually had acted for the defendant that the Dimmick firm was about to sue. Um, to make it clear, while babysitting somebody else's file. Yes, that's right. For um, 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> According to his dockets. Um, well, but it must it, have been only about two or three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was at Borden Lander. Oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, as soon as the fact came to the attention of the Dimmick firm, they took steps to build a Chinese wall. They, um, moved the file to a locked cabinet. The computer network was limited so that the associate didn't have access to the file. Mr. Crinson was not allowed to go into the offices of Mr. Dimmick or the associate working on the file. I guess he threw his memos in by uh, airmail. Um, and what the court did was consider two questions under the Martin and Gray test. Did the lawyer receive confidential information attributable to a solicitor-client relationship relevant to the matter at hand, so that's the first issue, and then if yes, is there a risk that the confidential information will be used to the prejudice of the former client? And the court was actually quite favorable on both issues, um, finding that the issues in the litigation were quite different from the matters that Mr. Crinson had been looking at while at Scott and Allen for his three minutes, um, but was prepared to give the de defendant the uh, benefit of the doubt on that, that there was a possibility that he might have come into contact with some confidential information. But having found that he didn't remember any of it, uh, the fact that the firm had so quickly put into place um, measures so that he wouldn't have any access to the file, and looking at the test, which is would a member of the public feel that any of this confidential information would be at risk, uh, found that it was not an appropriate case to remove the Dimmick firm as uh, counsel for the plaintiff in that case. Um, but this really is something that we all have to be careful of. Uh, I think that one of the things that saved the firm was the fact that they, did, they sent memos around on conflicts issues, that they acted very quickly in setting up all the requirements. And you can look at the Law Society rules. We've had to go through this a number of times. Um, it's really a big pain in the neck, uh, but it really is important that you, you take the steps to isolate the person uh, from the file. Ron, you want to deal with the second case? Yeah, the second case, we tried to get ourselves off the record, and we did not uh, succeed. Um, um, our client in the uh, Milani and Sacno had suggested to us that we were in a conflict of interest acting for him and another client. So we took this to mean that we shouldn't be acting for him in this proceeding, and uh, there was some also a dispute as to whether or not he was paying our bills. Um, <laughs> so a, a young lawyer in our office went to court to get us off the record if we could, and, and did not succeed. Uh, fortunately enough, we, we, did, we were able to continue to act and did take care of the judicial review proceeding. The judge uh, looked at it and said that uh, uh, the client uh, actually uh, had uh, expressed confidence in our firm, so uh, there was no concern about conflict with his interests. And uh, if it was just a matter of money, that should be worked out. And there was no complete breakdown of the relationship, which seemed to be the basis for his decision. So um, this was the year where we, uh, there was a, two attempts to get us off the record, and, uh, and uh, we lost one of them. and. Uh, and the, the Borden firm lost the other, but uh, I think it's very clear 
though, um, that you have to be very concerned about conflicts, especially with the new decision in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, to be vigilant that you're not going to prejudice the rights of your client seeking um, to advance the rights of another client. And that's something that we all have to be aware of. And in this, the latter case where they were trying to be removed from the record, one of the things the court noted was that there was an imminent trial date and uh, that the Dimmick firm had not served the lawyers on the other side. They had only given notice to the client and the court indicated that in a case like that you really should be serving the lawyers on the other side as well. Um, and I think also the fact that there was an imminent hearing date uh, made the court sort of think twice about removing uh, counsel at that late stage of the game. Um, just to wrap up, like they do in the in the movies, what do we have as coming attractions for uh, for 2004? Um, I'm not sure, Ron, if you were here when Don McCodrum um, mentioned a preview of next year's presentation, which will be that the Markman hearing you were trying to get in a Canadian case, the Court of Appeal dismissed in the last couple of weeks. Yes. Um, Don was relatively gloomy on the prospects of a Markman hearing. Uh, my understanding of the Federal Court of Appeal decision is it still leaves the opportunity available. Um, in certain circumstances for those of you that want to that want to try again. I should say that uh, the, the jury is still out as to whether or not we will seek leave uh, to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, based on the decision of the Court of Appeal which came out just uh, last uh, Friday. Uh, it seems that uh, the court was concerned that if they granted a Markman hearing in that case that it was quite likely that all other patent cases would have to be heard by way of a Markman if one or other of the parties wanted to have it to, uh, proceed in that way. Uh, but I agree with Don, it didn't foreclose uh, an opportunity of asking for a Markman in a, an appropriate situation where you're going to reach a just uh, determination by separating out the issues. Uh, the, um, the court also um, did a bold stroke by suggesting to uh, the parties, and I guess directed at, uh, at my client, that if it wanted to have a Markman hearing uh, considered as a, a proper procedure, because if they granted it in this case, it would have to apply to every other case, and they th said that that would really mean a rule change, that the intellectual property bar should take it up as an issue for debate, and if it was an appropriate thing to do, that to go to the Rules Committee of the Federal Court and they would consider it to see whether it was appropriate. So there's an opportunity to, I think, at the invitation of the court, to try and improve the way in which patent cases are litigated in our federal court. And it certainly needs some improvement. And I think uh, uh, the profession should take heed of what the Court of Appeal said and try and bring things before the Rules Committee. One of the things I thought was interesting in this decision is that uh, <coughs> Typically, you think of having, um, hiving off an issue will sort of assist in settlement and that that's something to be encouraged. While the court here said that Rule 107 was desi designed to assist the court in achieving the just, expeditious, and least expensive determination, rather than to assist the parties to reach an out-of-court settlement of their dispute. And I thought that was kind of an interesting spin on it because one would have thought that um, one of the ways to get it, the just, expeditious, and least expensive determination would be to, f to facilitate settlement amongst the parties. On that note, we've um, come to the conclusion of our panel. Uh, are there any questions from the audience before we move on to our last speaker? Hearing none, please join me in thanking uh, members of our panel for being here with us. While our, while our panel is packing up, I'd ask Roger Hughes to, uh, to step up to the podium that isn't here yet, but by the time you get here, it'll, it'll be here. Um, I've had the pleasure of working at uh, several, some would call it many law firms. Somebody described me as the Elizabeth Taylor of uh, the IP bar. Um, and, and unlike serial killers, I'm a serial partner, but uh, I'd like to now introduce another of my former partners uh, and a friend, uh, Roger Hughes. Uh, and if you haven't heard of Hughes on patents or Hughes on trademarks or Hughes on copyright or the Hughes on the federal court practice, then you don't know Hughes. Um, Roger is, um, is uh, certainly amongst the top uh, IP litigators in the country and uh, a pleasure to listen to, except when you're listening to his arguments in court. It's really painful to listen to those. Roger? Thank you.
Thanks, Don. Here comes the painful part, I guess. I was uh, speaking to some of the uh, Law Society people outside, and they said that there are 211 people signed up for this. And I said, my goodness, that must be the biggest one you have this year. And they said, yes. And I said, how many others have you had? And they said, none. So that's what happens when a lawyer asks a legal type question of people in the Law Society. I want to thank you who have remained. It's still very cold out there, and I'm sure that that's at least part of your motivation for remaining here, is to, that the alternative is pretty grim. And I've also undertaken with Mr. Lafreniere to make a note of those who did roll their eyes, drum their fingers, and otherwise fidget. The list is available on request on a payment of a small fee. Trademarks. This is at tab three of your material, and I'm indebted to Mr. McDonald and perhaps to Mr. Nichols for writing that. They indicated that I was part of an author, and having listened to what Sheldon Burstein said, I'm gonna to have to disclaim that. Uh, they took uh, certainly the burden in writing that, and I congratulate them for it. I just gave a couple of nudges and pokes from time to time, so I, I am indebted to them for doing that. Trademarks in the last year concentrated on the case law. There was no legislative amendments. There are no rule changes of substance. Fees go up, they always go up, um, that should interest you. So we're concentrating on the case law. And in terms of prospectiveness, the same thing. We're gonna be concentrating on the case law. Let me cluster them, somewhat different, to make it interesting, I'm not gonna read from the paper, into several little groups. The first one I wanna talk about is functionality. And that's the case of Kirkby, you'll see it in there, it's in your materials. I'm gonna to add to that the case of WCC and Hall All as well. Trademarks, unlike patents, unlike copyright, never come to an end. So as long as you have use, you have rights. As long as you have use, you can maintain a registration. Patents come to an end 17 or now 20 years from a certain point. Copyright comes to an end 50 years from the death of the author or groups of authors and so forth. Trademarks never come to an end. So people that want to exploit intellectual property want to run to the trademark end of the world and say, if I can say that this piece of intellectual property has a trademark attribute to it, then I can keep it forever. So in the case of Kirkby, and that was in the trial division, and now it's been determined in the Federal Court of Appeal, I understand that a leave application is pending to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Lego people, who have, you've all, everybody stepped late at night at one of the kids' Lego blocks when you sort of you know, walk to the bathroom or something like that. You, you know a deep impression that's left on your foot <laughs> by these Lego blocks. But the way that they fit one into the other is by a series of nubs on one end and a series of pockets on the other end to allow these incredibly uh, fantastic construction toys to be created. And the Lego people said, that's a trademark. And if you just stood back and closed your eyes and made a list of what are the attributes of a trademark, it's distinctive, people recognize it. It distinguishes me, people recognize it as being mine. I use it in advertising, I use it in promotion and so on. You would be saying yes, yes, yes to all of those little things about the little nubs and the little pockets and so forth. Now people want to make, that is competitors, want to make Lego because it's an incredibly successful product. They want to make a competitive product. They also want to make a competitive product that will fit with the Lego so the people who have bought their kids some Lego stuff can buy the other product and they can all work together to make these fantastic construction toys. The Lego people, Kirkby, wanted to say, no, you can't do that. Obviously they want to keep all the Lego to themselves and if people want to make a competitive kit they're going to have to do something different and they can't sell a kit that will fit with the Lego and so forth that you've already got somewhere in the basement. So they try to say this is a trademark. 
and the trial division and now the Federal Court of Appeal have said no. Functionality. This has a function. The little knobs and the little pockets fit with one another to function as a construction toy. And functionality trumps, if you like, all the other trademark attributes. You can go back to old, old cases like Well and Vale, where you had a, a dark handle on an ax that uh, made it stronger so it swung. And even back there, functionality trumps trademarks. Now, the same thing was held in the WCC case, which is also in your materials here, where somebody had an incredibly clever wastebasket that you had out in the bush, the provincial parks and so forth. And it had, at one point, an industrial design registration covering it. And the wastebasket functioned because squirrels couldn't get into it, the, the rain and the snow didn't seep into it, yet it's still handy to throw your rubbish into it. And then, of course, competitors wanted to get in the business and make similar wastebaskets and so forth. And the divisor of the wastebasket said, no, that's a trademark. People recognize my wastebasket as being unique and it's mine. All again, the same attributes. Again, the court said no. Functionality, which this has, trumps trademark rights. So I'm going to suggest to you that the, the stress and strain, if you like, of people wanting to expand or preserve their monopolies in some way, if you have a functional aspect to that, are going to find that they're going to have a problem. I want to get a little deeper into the Kirk B. case, because the Federal Court of Appeal, Justice Sexton wrote the decision, took a swipe or took a look at Section 7 of the Trademarks Act. Section 7 of the Trademarks Act, as you all know, is in effect a federal codification of the passing off and unfair competition aspects in many ways of intellectual property that would otherwise, I would suggest to you, be within the jurisdiction of the province. And Section 7E, as you all know, any act contrary to unfair, comp honest uh, industrial usage in Canada has been held to be unconstitutional. Every once in a while, somebody who tries to resurrect it gets snacked down again. The Federal Court of Appeal said that Section 7 does not extend to something that isn't within the intellectual property regime of the federal government. So that if you don't have a trademark, because this thing is functional, you don't have a look-in in federal legislation or jurisdiction of the federal court, because Section 7 doesn't cover it. So Section 7 is not broader than intellectual property rights otherwise recognized, for instance, in this case, under the Trademarks Act. It used to be that you'd get yourself into the federal court or into federal legislation by sort of saying, well, Section 7 is much broader than just trademarks. And this case has shrunk it down to trademarks. And if you don't have a trademark, you don't have jurisdiction, you don't have jurisdiction, you're out of this court. Now, as I say, this, may, this is on appeal, if they, sorry, on leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. If they get leave, I'm hoping that they will explore that section. You may remember the case of McDonald and Vapor that explored it previously in a very long decision of uh, Chief Justice Laskin. They may have another crack at it. I don't know. But I would suggest to you that that's one of the more interesting aspects. Now, I'm going to slide from that, if you want to jump to page seven of the materials, to color. Because color is kind of like functionality. So my first topic is functionality, and I'm going to talk about color. Tablets. Granny knows if she takes her triangular pink pills that she's taking her medicine. So a pharmaceutical company would like to monopolize, if you like, triangular pink pills so that the evil generics that lurk in the background, we've heard all about it in the previous uh, discussions, can't not only make the same drug, but can't make it in a triangular pink pill or something looks, that looks awfully close to the triangular pink pill, so that Granny won't be upset when she's swallowing the generic instead of the brand product. 
And the Nova Farm case there is one of those cases where they call them brand name or first in uh, or in innovator drug companies said, I want to register the shape and color of a tablet for a tablet that contains drug X. And the court said, I'm not going to let you do that. Because what Granny is recognizing is not you, the drug company, as being the source. Granny's recognizing that this is drug X. So if I want to take drug X, I take these pills of this certain shape and color. So that it doesn't have a trademark attribute of distincting, distinguishing the source. It has an attribute of distinguishing the kind of product. That one, I expect, is still on appeal, too. But you can see how the court is being asked to make trademarks bear the burden of intellectual property that people are seeking to get or extend or maintain. And the court is resisting that kind of effort to extend under the aegis of trademark law rights that may otherwise not quite fall under that. So I'll leave you with that. While I'm talking about Rittrick and Section 7, let the bells go off that as of the first of this year, there's a new limitation period regime in Ontario. The two years and 15 years instead of the old 6 and 20. Trademarks Act does not have a built-in limitation period. The Federal Court Act, if you happen to be in an action in the Federal Court, has a default section of six years. But that's if you can't otherwise find an appropriate limitation period, either in the federal statute or in the province that governs the, uh, what's going on. So if you're going to sue under the Trademarks Act, or indeed under Section 7, or if you're going into the province and doing under general common law, sort of passing off unfair competition, remember the numbers have changed. It's a new regime, and I just see that the Law Society itself is going to have a program on limitation periods. We're all wondering just how far and how long and where it extends to. I just leave you with that flag. OK, let's shift ground a little bit. Section 9 of the Trademarks Act, it's vexed everybody's so-called official marks. And we're still struggling with who is a public authority, who is a person that can get the benefit of these official marks. It's not in the paper, but I can tell you that those of you who've been following the Blue Nose saga of Nova Scotia, where some rights had been purportedly transferred to a, a sort of a, an agency administering Blue Nose, and the government and then a third party who was alleged to have appropriate or misappropriated the right. That case has been settled, thank goodness. So that's off the table now. Um, the court gets a little exasperated where two agencies, each of whom might be a government or quango, if you're Sir Humphrey doing the, uh, doing the uh, Yes Minister series, um, are claiming rights against each other. And that's the Royal Roads case. They want to take the parties aside and I think shake them. But what the heck are you two government agencies doing in a court spending money on lawyers instead of just going out and settling it? And then there's the Chosen People case, which is a, a case where an agency had registration as a charity for purposes of giving the money and getting your tax receipt. And they said, that's not enough. You're not a public authority simply because you've got one of those tax receipts. There's all kinds of other stuff swirling around these official marks. None of them have yet gotten uh, definitively uh, before the courts. And there's still, of course, all kinds of efforts to amend or change that section. But that's still somewhere up there. Next category, page six, foreign marks. There is an effort, and I think we've seen it in various non-Canadian publications and seminars and so on, to create a concept of famous mark. We know that as you know, 
as we can't dig minerals out of our ground anymore, the third world countries are doing that, so we shift to manufacturing, and now that we can't manufacture cheaply anymore, third world countries are manufacturing just as good and much cheaper. And so we have intellectual property now as a sort of commodity in which we, the intelligentsia of the first world trade, that there's an effort in saying that there are certain trademarks that are so famous that notwithstanding they're not used in your country or that we don't otherwise fit within the attributes of your trademarks act as far as acquiring rights, we are trademarks and we are famous. And there's some legislation in Europe and some pushing and shoving and what have you because companies want to say, well, if we're big in our own home country here in Europe or here in the US, we don't need to be present in your country in order to nonetheless have trademark type rights. <coughs> Canada has resisted that. And there are two cases, there's earlier cases as well, dealing as far back as Hilton Hotels and other places. Canada has really resisted that. And they said, no, you, just because you're big in your home country or big in some international sense, unless you find yourself used in Canada or you can demonstrate that you're made known, which is an odd thing under the Trademarks Act, um, in Canada, you don't just have trademark rights because you're a big shot in your own country. And the latest one on that is Boston Chicken, where they in fact had a Canadian registration and the court said, that's no good. Your Canadian registration is based simply on your US registration. And if you're coming in trying to enforce that mark in Canada, we're going to look and see if you're really distinctive in Canada. The other one is a Vive Clicquot. Now, some of you may over the holidays have, in fact, indulged in Vive Clicquot. But uh, they, they were not famous enough to stop somebody setting up uh, boutiques selling clothing and the like under the Clicquot mark. This is sort of indicative of the Canadian trend. If that trend is going to be changed, it's going to have to be legislative and not judicial. Jumping up to page 8 and 9, and page 14, if you like. Registration as a defense. In the previous year, our Ontario Court of Appeal held that the Canadian statute on trademarks, in a case called Molson and Labatt, um, was different from the UK Trademarks Act, which in the UK they held that if you have a registration, that's no defense for an action for passing off. Um, in Canada, they held that you, it is a defense. So that if you have a registered trademark and somebody sues you for passing off, a good defense is, I have that registration. I'm entitled to use the mark to heck with you. And the case called Jonathan and the, and the case in, the, in Quebec, Agapur, both sort of reinforce that thought so that our legislation is different enough from the UK legislation, which had otherwise established that principle, that a defense is available in Canada, even though people thought it wasn't. Moving a little bit on to um, sort of personality rights, and here's where the copyright that Sheldon Burstein addressed and trademarks sort of mesh or sort of slop over into a general arm-waving kind of common law. Uh, Salé, Jamie Salé and, and Pelche, people who are famous in other respects, a photographer in Edmonton had gotten some, or took some pictures of them and uh, was attempting to sell them without the consent or authorization of those people. The Alberta courts issued an injunction. So just remember, it's only an interlocutory injunction at this stage to say, no, there's sufficient personality rights, even though the photographer may own the copyright in the photographs. There's sufficient rights in personality and exploitation that at least until trial, we're going to prevent the distribution and use of this material by the photographer. Now, I don't know if this has ever got to or going to trial. I certainly don't know. But this reinforces, we've got cases going back to cases called Athens and um, 
Bobby Krause in Ontario that in effect said the same thing, that there's, if there's enough personality in your image, your so on, the courts will step in and protect that. So this is a reinforcement of that. Let me get to a case that I think is absolutely bizarre. And that's um, at page nine of your materials, Hilfiger and International Clothiers. Tommy Hilfiger, we've seen the shops and we've seen the, the clothing and so on around, has a crest, usually on the, on the shirt pocket area of clothing, perhaps elsewhere, which it has registered and demonstrated to the trial judge that it uses as a trademark to identify its goods in Canada. So that if you come down wearing a golf shirt and I see this little crest, I say, oh, that's a Tommy Hilfiger um, shirt or what have you. So that's, that's all pretty standard stuff. The defendant said, yep, we've got a crest and the court found it looked pretty close to the Hilfiger crest, but we don't use it as a trademark. We just have a crest there. Everybody has a crest, you know, it's just one more doggone crest. You could be a schoolboy's crest or something like that. And the court said, yeah. You're not using that as a trademark. Therefore, you're not infringing. However, it looks pretty close, so you're passing off. That's weird. Um, I mean, what it does is allow an element of subjectivity into a defense to a trademark infringement action, which I find rather strange. And then it sort of is a sort of a, a lame attempt to put it right by somehow sliding into passing off and saying, well, if the other things, and they found the cut and shape of the garment was also kind of close and what have you, it, you're also... Uh, passing off, so therefore you're stopped anyway. It seems to me to do violence to a lot of our principles of trademark law, and uh, I'm against change, even change for the better, but I don't see this as, as being changed for the better. Um, it's on appeal. I, I hope somebody takes a closer look to that at that one, but in the meantime, if you're in the federal court trial division, and you're acting for a defendant, you can say, I didn't mean to, I was times, it's really not a trademark, you know? Take a shot at it, because that seems to be the present defense, flavor of the month. Section 45. Section 45 of the Trademarks Act, as you know, is kind of one of these cheap, dirty, and easy ways of annoying your friends by writing a simple letter and closing a couple of bucks and sicking the trademarks office on them. Um, also getting rid of Deadwood if you're sort of being very academic about it. But the trademarks office after three years is supposed to look at registrations if somebody pokes them to do so and ask the registered owner to say, you know, are you really using that mark and if so for, for what products or services and having regard to the registration. And the trademarks office seems to be seems to be very lenient in allowing excuses or what have you. I've given you two cases, um, ConAgra and Special. I can't read my own writing. Consulting, where in ConAgra they said, "Well, we're using it in the sense that we're market testing it. We've got a few products out there, and we're kind of dangling them around, to see if people like them." And they said, "Okay, that's use." And then the other one, they said, well, we weren't using it, but we've been trying to get a licensee and the dog ate my homework and, you know, and so it's all kind of happening still, so why don't you let us go? And they said, yeah, okay, that's good enough. Again, it, it seems to me that this is indicative of a trend, if you like, sort of like the foreign registrations and the functionality. I'm not, not trying to drill into the cases more than tell you the trend. that. They seem to be soft right now on Section 45. So as long as you give them an answer and give them something that might sound plausible to somebody somewhere somehow, then maybe you got a shot at keeping your registration alive. Page 13, disclaimers. Now we all know the disclaimer trick 
and for the one person maybe in this room that doesn't know the disclaimer trick, the Trademarks Act says that if you file an application for registration and include in that a disclaimer, then you've lost or you've clearly said you've abandoned all rights. If the Trademarks Office makes you do the disclaimer, then you're not deemed to have abandoned your rights. So in other words, if you've got a word like um, full scap paper, and you file an application and don't disclaim full scap paper, um, the Trademarks Office makes you do that, then you haven't been deemed to abandon the rights even though the Trademarks Office does. Um, on the, in this case, the Fiesta barbecue case, they had a design registration. It's not quite clear from the, uh, from the text here, but it was the words grill, gear, and design. And they were required to disclaim grill gear. And then the other party came forward and said, well, look at all this other grill gear. For, you know, when you got a barbecue and somebody wants to sell you a spatula or a scrubber or some spray or whatever to use with your barbecue, often they call it grill gear. So what the heck are you doing? And the court, Justice Russell, in one of his first decisions, I'll just leave you with that, um, said, well, no, there's a disclaimer there. So we can't look too hard on what other people are doing with grill gear. He didn't say, but I think he meant to say, but, and it's a design, the design looks pretty distinctive to me. He did say in the decision, and those third party uses, I'm not terribly impressed by them. So you're gonna have to wonder whether it's obiter or not, whether the case really turned on the fact that there wasn't enough evidence about the use of grill gear by third parties. But I leave you with that, that the old disclaimer trick is still around. Page 14, extensions. In Lausanne, they tried a pretty good trick. I think those of you who have applied to register trademarks and who have the unfortunate uh, luck of having clients. Remember that Snoopy cartoon where Snoopy comes in, he's, you know, he's the lawyer and he says, you know, law, law, I love law, I just hate my clients. Um, where your client asks you to register something for boots, shoes, uh, milk, and potatoes, and so you get it all through, and it's ready to be registered. It's a proposed use, of course. And you've got use of boots, shoes, but not on milk and potatoes. What do you do? Well, right now, you write for extensions of time and say, you know, I gotta buy some aftershaves for how about six months? And they say, sure, and what have you. Um, what they try to do there is say, no, no, give me the registration for boots and shoes, and let's hold off on the other one so that I can get milk and potatoes later on. And they said, no, no. It's a full meal deal, if you like. You've either got to get your registration for everything, or you abandon the things for which you don't have a demonstrable use, and you file again. You can't get this kind of partial registration. Nice try. It was worth a thought, but didn't work. Lastly, pages 15 and to the end. Just like to say that the province of Quebec is steadfastly keeping the uh, rights of the butter manufacturers of Canada alive and refusing to allow margarine to be colored in the province of Quebec. So welcome the little button that you have to work in. I, I grew up in, in Quebec and I remember granny working the button in all the time and you, perhaps some of you can do as well. So that's still alive. It's nice to know that some things never change. Don, Don thank you. Uh, 40 years ago uh, this year I moved with my family from Vancouver to Montreal and I was initiated into the, uh, the white margarine syndrome and the margarine was not allowed to be colored the same color as butter because then people would buy it. <laughs> anyway, thank you Roger for bringing me up to date on childhood <laughs> memories. Um, I, have, uh, I have a couple of things to ask of you. Just let me double check my notes. Oh yeah. Um, that concludes today's proceedings but for uh, the authors spent hours and hours writing their papers, 
Could you do us a favor and spend one minute writing your paper? The evaluation for the course is found just inside the booklet. And I do mean that people spend hours and hours doing this. If you have any suggestions, comments, or whatever, please fill them in. If you have to hurry back to have lunch, there is a fax number on page two where you can complete it and send it in. But I'd ask you to do the, the least you can do and fill that in. Secondly, for those of you interested in losing weight, having whiter teeth, and growing hair, um, I suggest you read this material. Uh, too often people come to these things uh, and then go back to their office and put it back on the shelf. But you will lose weight, have shinier teeth, and uh, gain hair, if that's what you're interested in. Some people are. I don't understand myself. The material you're getting is really the Reader's Digest uh, summaries of the cases from last year. And if you want to get a good start on this year, spend the time over the next month, go through all the materials. You will be smarter. You will be more charming. Um, and you will have greater success in life. Yeah, a question at the back? Oh, yeah. Well, what did you think of the Ottawa speakers? Well, if, <laughs> if, you would kindly, um, if you'd kindly replace Mr. Macera with Mr. Cameron, that would be me. Or I can fill that part in if you just want to leave that blank. Uh, and then just to remind you as to who the speakers were, who were the speakers this morning? Put uh, Don McCodrum, um, Sheldon, or if you want to just put Don, Sheldon, and then the panel, of course, was, uh, was Roger. Uh, oh, it's beautiful that Ron Dimmick's name would line up with Tony Creeper. They've been suing each other over the past uh, 20 years. And uh, we'll substitute Carol for Elizabeth. And last and certainly not least, Roger. So everybody, at least in my copy, it's got the Ottawa speakers as well. So, Some have Toronto speakers. Some have Toronto speakers? Well, then you people figure it out. This is a, this is a test. Uh, thank you all for coming. As Roger mentioned, 211 registrants. I think that's a new record for us. And... Um, I'm both delighted and scared to find out that there are 210 competitors of mine in Toronto that now I have to, now we're as smart as, uh, as the panelists. Thank you all for coming. Hope to see you next year. <laughs>